Welcome. I'm Michelle Rowling from Student Counseling Services, and I'm thrilled to see so many people out tonight um, for this fantastic presentation. Um, we are so excited to have so many great events happening this year for um, National Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2009, and the theme at Iowa State this year is Rock Your Body. Um, there are several people that I want to thank quickly. Uh, first and foremost, my family, who um, um, I'm missing in action for several weeks before this week, and then um, I'm pretty pretty done for next week. So um, I'm just aware that um, I want to thank them publicly. Um, I have um, a lot of support and a lot of volunteers. In particular, I want to acknowledge Linnea Ethington, um, one of our postdoc interns who's doing her eating disorder concentration and clear in the back Anna Rudroff, um, the eating disorder graduate assistant um, this year at the counseling center and the student counseling set staff who are here everybody wave if you're on staff at the counseling center um, lots of support and this year we had over 80 volunteers from campus helping so raise your hand if you've helped in any way this week with eating disorders awareness week thank you all so much Um, we have the sponsors listed in your program. In particular, I would like to acknowledge the three big sponsors for this year's Eating Disorders Awareness Week. Casa Palmera out of California, uh, Park Nicolette, Melrose Institute out of Minnesota, and Alexian Brothers Behavioral Hospital out of Illinois. Um, without their funding and their support, um, we would not be having the kind of amazing week that we're having here on campus. So I'd like to make sure we acknowledge them. And I neglected to list one department on the um, programs, um, so I also want to make sure that um, the Department of Human um, and Family Sciences gets acknowledged for their contribution. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Lee Cohn to you this evening. Lee is the publisher of Gertz Books, a company that specializes in eating disorder education and publications since 1980. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of Eating Disorders, the Journal of Treatment and Prevention, and publisher of Eating Disorders Review, a clinical newsletter, and Eating Disorders Today, a newsletter for individuals in recovery and their loved ones. Since the early 1980s, he has spoken about eating disorders at colleges and universities, hospitals, to community groups, and as a keynote speaker at professional conferences for the National and International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals, Academy of Eating Disorders, the American, Health, American College Health Association, Massachusetts Eating Disorder Association, the ELISA Project, among others. He has also spoken at such universities as Notre Dame, Duke, Penn State, Ohio State, Shippenburg University, Georgia State, University of Calgary, Nebraska, K-State, California State, um, University of Georgia, and many others. He's the co-author of several books. He is best known for Bulimia, A Guide to Recovery, which he co-authored with his wife, Lindsay Hall, and which has sold more than 150,000 copies. He is also the author of Making Weight, a men's um, guide to eating disorder and body image issues. Please join me in welcoming Lee Cohn. Thank you. Oh. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. It's, it's a big deal to me, anyway. Um, it's interesting to, to have a talk on men's bodies and have mainly women show up for it. Uh, <laughs> If you have any questions at all, just ask and we'll see what they have to say. Uh, you're probably wondering why I asked that the room be divided this way. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I've asked the women to be on one side and the men on the other. Anybody notice that? And uh, that's because I, throughout the evening I might ask some questions to everybody. And um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of responses the women have compared to the men. Let me move this down a little bit. It's a little bit loud. Is that better? No, not really. There, okay. So let's just uh, start with an experiment. If you're a woman, raise your hand. Great, okay. If you're a man, raise your hand. Okay. All right, twice was fine. Yeah. Um, okay, so good. You're, it shows that you're willing to participate a little bit. 
uh, you're not being graded on it. Uh, how many of you are here uh, are required to be here for class tonight, too? Oh my gosh. I thought you were all required to be here. So again, thank you very, very much for showing up. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk tonight a lot about men and about women and eating disorders, body image. I'll talk a lot about myself. You'll get really sick of me. I wonder if we could get these big fluorescents off, um, whoever's working the lights. Apparently not. But let's start by talking about today's man. How would, you, how would we describe today's man? Well, he's hopeful and optimistic, intelligent, right guys? Compassionate, huh? Yeah? Everybody shaking their head, no? Athletic, yeah. Tall and lanky, does it sound like anyone you know? So, and really, I want to thank you again for being here tonight. You could have been listening to President Obama tonight instead, but we'll catch him later on TiVo. Um, but let me ask you a question. Do you think that if Barack Obama, do you think he would have been uh, elected president if he uh, weighed 300 and 350 pounds, something like that? What do you think? Probably not. However, if you, things have not always been this way. And what we have is we have cyclical events over history. A hundred years ago, when William Howard Taft was president, he was admired for his size. Uh, when they brought his, when six guys, they needed six guys to carry in his bathtub into the White House, and they had to knock out walls to get it into the, to get it in there for him, because they needed an extra large bathtub, and it made front page news. Uh, and it wasn't ridiculed. Uh, he wasn't being ridiculed for that. He was being admired and loved. He was a beloved president, much like we're all loving uh, Barack Obama right now. And, uh, but the, my point being is that, that fashions change, styles change, and what we perceive of as, as the, the best body, the most perfect form, that's changed too. Because when Lillian Russell was the most admired woman, I mean, you know, she was the, I don't know, Angelina Jolie of her day or something. Uh, so fashions change over time. Uh, a, a big shift occurred in the 60s, the late 60s, with Twiggy. Um, and she brought in this anorexic chic look. She was, you know, thin as a twig, Twiggy, right? Um, and very rapidly, the culture changed, and women wanted to be really thin. Um, into the 70s, you know, we were all kind of thin back then. Um, but styles changed, uh, as you can tell. Uh, I don't look exactly the same now as I looked then, <laughs> right? Oh, I keep telling my wife that I do. She, she, tell, she says, no, th this is what we, lo we looked like, um, I know, 30 years ago when we fell in love at first sight. And um, we were, I, I, some of what I say tonight might be a little on the risque side, and I hope that, you know, I, I'm not saying things that would be disapproved of by the religious right or anything, but in any case, uh, 30 years ago, we fell in love, over, a little over 30 years ago, we fell in love at first sight, and within, you know, and we, we, we were living together very, very, very quickly, and um, after about a month, she said to me that she had done this terrible thing, a horrible thing. I was going to hate her. I thought maybe she'd like killed her parents, was an axe murderer. I didn't know. What do, you know, what do I know? Uh, but she told me about her, uh, her, her eating disorder, that she ate huge amounts of food and threw it up several times a day. And uh, at that time, there was no word for bulimia. It was called bulimorexia then. And uh, there were no books written. Our book was the first. Uh, incidentally, that's what Lindsay looks like now. There we are. And um, we worked on her recovery together and wrote about it and wrote more and published more. And, you know, 30 years later, here I am. So that's how I got into the eating disorders field. Uh, we have a company, as Michelle said, called Gers Books, bulimia.com. If you want to know anything about eating disorders, uh, it's a great place to go. And uh, we also have a, a really um, well 
well, we have a catalog there that is used throughout the country. Um, over 250,000 uh, people get it. And so uh, we're very involved in the eating disorders field. Uh, about 10 years ago or so, I approached a man by the name of Arnold Anderson, who's at you know, uh, Iowa State and Iowa City. Uh, he had written a book called Males with Eating Disorders. Uh, and I said, do you want to write a book together f for lay people? Because it's been 10 years, no one else has written anything about men and eating disorders. So we wrote that together with a guy by the name of Tom Holbrook. And ever since then, I've been traveling around talking about men's issues. And, and really, no one wants to hear it too much. Um, uh, it's, it's a dark little secret that men have issues with their bodies as well as women. So I, 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 I described today's man, but actually many men today can't communicate well, uh, they, especially their feelings. They have anxiety about the economy, the war, violence, health, sexuality. They're confused, they're vulnerable. They want their lives to have meaning, but they don't know what, what to do to, to find meaning in their lives. And, and they're, they're actually very unhappy in their own skin. Uh, it's a sad state of affairs. And you know, especially in, in, in the, these days where we're also worried about the economy, you guys don't know where you'll be in a few years if you'll have jobs or not have jobs. Um, you know, your parents don't know if they'll have houses or won't have houses in many cases. Uh, so it's very trying times. And with as much pressure as we're, we're under these days, you know, you really don't want to be fixating on problems that you're perceiving about your body. So if you get anything at all out of this, men and women, uh, tonight, you know, I hope you, you get the sense that you don't really need to sweat it about your bodies. Your bodies are okay. You're okay. And I'm going to talk about that throughout the night. Let me ask some questions. Okay, women. Who are some of your body image role models, would you say? Just throw out some names. Come on. Marissa Miller. Marissa Miller. Who is that? Secret. Say that again? She's a Victoria's Secret model. Okay, a Victoria's Secret model. Uh, that's interesting because uh, we have unreasonable <laughs> standards for women. For example, the average model, you know, I, I don't know you. The average model is 5'11 and weighs 117 pounds. Okay, I assume Marissa Miller is somewhere in that. Not knowing who she is, I assume she's in, in that range. Every day I get older. Um, the average American woman is 5'4 and weighs 140 pounds. So if your role model is 7 inches taller than you are, and you're not going to grow 7 inches, and if she weighs 30 pounds less than you are, you've got a bad role model there. And, and these are the role models that we, the kind of role models that we have. Most fashion models are actually thinner than 98% of American women. Okay? Let's try it again. Who are some of your body image role models? Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. Okay. <laughs> That's a good answer. Good answer. Um, give the guys five points for that. Um, well, uh, all right, so he, he's tall, he's thin, right? He's athletic, he's muscular. Anyone else come to mind? Danny DeVito. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Danny DeVito. Uh, anyone else? <coughs> Athletes, right? LeBron or Kobe or unreasonable standards for men. For one thing, pro athletes represent such a small percentage of the population that I don't even know what that number is. It's so, any math majors in here can tell me what that number is. It's really a small percentage. The average American man is 5'9 and weighs 175 pounds. And yet our role models, such as Hugh Jackman, I'm guessing here, probably about 6'2, 165 maybe, something like that, 160. So again, we have unreasonable standards. I really debated about this next little factoid, but I, f I felt it was important to share it with, with you guys especially. And, and women just kind of, right? Uh, <laughs> men are very also preoccupied with 
their bodily parts, you know. And um, the average erect American penis is 5.1 to 5.9 inches long. Well, I, I don't know, I, I won't ask anybody, right? <laughs> uh, but I, I will say that whenever I've heard guys talking about their thing, you know, I've never heard anyone say, I'm 5'1", you know, <laughs> 5.1. It's always, you know, well, I'm, you know, 18 inches long or something like that, you know, built like an elephant and you know, like a horse. Again, unreasonable standards. So if you got any, guys, if you got anything at all out of this tonight, you know, it's that you're okay, all right? You're really okay. Because what we're bombarded with is images that are unrealistic and they're not real. For example, these are not real, right? <laughs> those, those were artificially made with silicone, right? And if you look at this guy here that has these huge pecs and he has his head, it is physically impossible to put your head that way with your body in that position. It, you just can't do it. The head, so understand that the images that you see are being manipulated. We're seeing things that aren't real, and we're being told, but this is what you want to look like. Plastic surgery, men and women, $8.4 billion on cosmetic surgery. Let's talk about media literacy. Um, and to do that, I'm going to show you some, some TV clips, because I know that, you know, by now, if, if you're back in your dorms or wherever, you'd be watching TV, you'd probably miss it. Jones in a little bit, and uh, so let's let's watch a little TV. He's a real no I became what? Bulimic. <laughs> Matilda. <laughs> Matilda. <laughs> so what? I throw up after lots of meals. So do I. It's great. NBC News feed. Mmm, feed. You get to see what they do during commercial breaks. We'll be right back with a special report on soccer moms who hate soccer. Clear. Oh, Lord, I'm so fat. So, you know, one big problem that I have with the media is that eating disorders, and especially male eating disorders, are just not taken seriously. It's they don't exist, or let's just make a joke about it. And it's really not a joking matter, as you'll, you'll hear. And we've all, we all know about women and images about women. We've, if you were here last night, you saw America the Beautiful. The whole movie was about women's images. So of course, we have the slender, sexy, lose weight, all of these influences on women. Profile victim of an eating disorder. Fans were shocked to see her frail physique in the summer of 2004 and soon learned she was being treated for anorexia. In Hollywood, thin may be in, but these days the waifish figure is so 1992. So, you know, I, I've been in this field for over 30 years. I, I, I was in the eating disorders field before the eating disorders field was an eating disorders field, and there are you know, a hundred videos on women's issues. There's very little on men. So we don't need to see all that women's stuff. You've all already heard it. Let's talk about the men. I know before I go swimming, I like to grease up a little bit. Is Kyle Royster, a 24 year old aerospace engineer from Virginia? Idaho's Mark Skates is number two, the 30 year old federal law enforcement officer. And ET's pick for number one is Jason Cooper from New Orleans. His body was all beefcake. He has those ripped abs, he has great symmetry, you can tell he has a totally fit body, and you know he definitely works out. He's almost like a window mannequin, he's so perfect. Pick. Can I get one of you guys up here to volunteer so we can judge your body? <laughs> Anyone? No? Okay. Well, Pictures of that. Mario in a pair of white Hurley board shorts proved he was in top shape. So, of course, muscles are in. I gotta admit, I'm a little excited to see somebody that right off the bat, I'm like, wow, he's hot. Oh, and get some 
I just want to point out that I haven't counted them, but I think there's about 300 male nipples that you'll see in this, in this show tonight. <laughs> I couldn't show any women's uh, for obvious reasons. And the point being that on TV, that's all you see with men these days is, is their shirts off. You can't see women with their shirt off, right? So you see men all the time with their shirt off. Have you ever seen uh, a, a TV show, even the most, you know, Victoria's Secret uh, supermodel show, that they're all greasing themselves up? I mean, it's just not done. But you can get away with stuff when you're sexually objectifying men. Tummy tight and do your Hi, Tom. How you doing? Good. This is a nice chest. And if you don't start to love the way you look in just one month, simply return it and we'll refund your money. Known for his love of the outdoors, Matthew can often be found with friends in Malibu, surfing, playing frisbee, and of course, doing what he does best, showing off shirtless. Matt McConaughey's best beach assets are his chest, his pecs, and his abs. You can't find any fault with them. They are tight, they are perfectly formed. You just can't complain. Arnold Schwarzenegger's Mount. Did you guys hear that? When, when they showed the muscular guy, all the women went, ew. <laughs> so if that doesn't tell you something about this hype about having to be super muscular, is that what we're looking for, our women? No. Anyone here really want their man to be super ripped like that? What do you want from a man? Compassion. Love, compassion, <laughs> right? of muscle earned him the nickname the Austrian Oak. He also won seven Mr. Olympia titles. In April 2003, Arnold's bodybuilding physique was long gone. Unfortunately, he kept the teeny bikini briefs. This was one speedo that was a definite speed don't. The monkey bars and so, you know, if you don't have those muscles in the media, then you're ridiculed. Val's success didn't go to his head, but more than 10 years later, it did appear to go to his gut. I have lost a little of my speed, a little of my fire. Here's what I used to look like. Look at those biceps. We were fighting the power and eating whatever we wanted. You know what? Fat people are not <laughs> monsters. Look at the outside of this building. It is ugly. But you come inside, and it is beautiful. Just like this unappealing fat suit. No matter how big his belly is, it just doesn't matter. He's Jack. What are you, Jack? A 34D now? After an invigorating dip in the ocean, Jack checked his tan, did some... He's like 70 stretches, years old. Give him a break here. Come on. Extra large hoagie. Pounds in 20 weeks. We watched what we ate. It used to be that all the diet ads on TV were about women. Really does work. But now, Goodbye, you see men and women. Hello, the new us. Lost it. Why do you think that is? Why did that happen, do you think? No business majors here? No marketing majors? It's a new market. It's a new market, sure. If 80% of women are already on diets or have dieted, and if there's $40 billion a year spent in the diet industry, and if you're a marketing person in the diet industry, I, I can just see it. They were sitting around, somebody said, Boy, we have every woman in America hung up about her body. She feels bad about herself. She's buying our products. What should we do, just raise the prices? How can we make more money? And someone said, I got it, I got it. Let's make men feel bad about themselves. Let's make men think they have to lose weight or get you know, more bulky. An average of up to four and a half times the weight than with diet and exercise alone. I strongly recommend it, both as a new doctor and someone who used it with fantastic results. I lost uh, 38 and a half pounds, so, yeah. And then the, the flip end of the muscular thing is the thinness look. Jared Leto lost 25 pounds to play a heroin junkie in the critically acclaimed film Requiem for a Dream. How'd you lose the weight? I, uh, starved myself. So that's an advertisement for anorexia. Guys, if you want to become anorexic, be like Jared Leto. This star yourself. was seen tanning topless. Our hearts stopped. He isn't fat, but he's not. Is that so bad, women? Do you, I, I mean, 
they're all shaking their heads no. I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio, wasn't he kind of like a uh, sex symbol some time ago? Yeah? I mean, is that so bad? Tone. I was actually shocked when I saw him take his shirt off. Totally make over your entire body exactly the way you want it, all in as little as six weeks. A brow lift and upper eyelid lift. His ears set back. His nose was refined and straightened. His skin cleared with lasers and acne treatments. Do you feel the same way if you lose your hair? Sure. She'll just feel it about somebody else. So it's not just the body for men. It's the hair thing. If you're losing your hair, well, let me get this straight. You're supposed to have hair on your head, so if, you, if you're losing it, you have to buy some kind of product or get transplants or something, but you're supposed to shave the rest of you because you're not supposed to have hair anywhere else? Is it, I mean, what is it? We're nuts. Culturally, we're just crazy. The solution is hair transplantation. Plus. Don't let erectile dysfunction get in the way. Side effects may include headache, flushing, upset stomach, and abnormal vision. To avoid long-term injury, seek immediate medical help for an erection lasting more than four hours. And, and I think that's, that's good advice. Uh, guys, erections lasting more than four hours, be sure to call your doctor on that. Um, <laughs> and, and really, you know, th they have these Viagra ads, and, and I can't tell you how many. Women, how many of you have gotten emails from uh, penis enlargement surgery? Yeah, everyone, right? Any of you get, get that procedure? No. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a good question. Women, do you want to be made love to for four hours? <laughs> Anyone? I've been married 30 years, and, you know, we, you know, we're a very passionate, loving couple, as I think I've made clear, but Four hours? And, and this is what they're selling you? you know, they're saying, take this pill and you're, you know, they don't want that anyway. Because without trust, all we have is sex. So you and I can spend the. So, you know, basically, as I said, every love-making scene that's been on television or in, or in movies in the last 10 years or so, pay attention to this when, when you're watching TV, the guy is always on his back. He's always, you know, undressed from the waist up. You always see, the, like, the woman's shoulder or the back of her head or something, but, you know, that's all you see of her. And there's always a close-up on the, the, the man's nipple. So, you know, when, when people say, well, you know, men don't have it as bad in the media as women do, that's ridiculous. Men are every bit as objectified and sexualized as men, as women are. A whole weekend in bed. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> I'll leave myself alone till then. <laughs> now, on this one here, like you see, I had to scratch my back. That no, was this. No, it looks, it looks like it's been blow dried. <laughs> will, will you talk into this picture? I'm, it's a great. Uh, I, uh, it was, uh, you know, we, uh, was it your idea? <laughs> no, no. I, uh... No, actually, honestly, that was, uh... I was, w I was wearing a shirt. Yeah. And the, uh, computer thing took that... And really took yeah, the shirt off? I didn't know. Really, really. The computer thing took my shirt off. <laughs> now, I mean, you're, you're all a little too young probably to remember when Tom Cruise was actually a sex symbol. But there was a time that he was. And it was around the time that that was being, uh, being shown. And he was um, obviously knew that Jay Leno was going to show that magazine. He obviously knew that he was in that magazine on the cover of it. And yet this, you know, role model of male perfection at that time, he can't get a word out. You know, they took the computer thing, took my shirt off. You know, a blithering idiot when faced with body image. Well, how's that supposed to make the rest of us guys feel? You know, if we don't look like that 0.00005% of the per perfect, quote, perfect people, then 
you know, if we don't, if even Tom Cruise doesn't feel good about the way he looks, how do you think these guys feel? Right? So that's media literacy, and I, I really encourage you to be more media literate because <laughs> there's a lot of consequences to disliking the way you look. And here are some of them. So, the media makes us feel bad about ourselves. Magazine pictures, superstars, entertainment tonight, celebrities, they all make us feel bad about ourselves. In the most extreme cases, people that feel bad about themselves and the way they look develop eating disorders. And these problems are not gender specific. Men get eating disorders in the same way that women get eating disorders. All right, women, let's ask some questions. How many of you would like to lose weight? Raise your hands. Okay. Men, how many of you would like to lose weight? So percentage-wise, it looked pretty close to me, actually. How about this? How many of you would like to put on muscle? Yeah, in the back, thank you. Um, Actually, as many men would like to change their body as women would. 80% of women would like to lose weight. But 80% of men would like to change their bodies. Half of them would like to get thinner. Half of them would like to put on more muscle. Ta I'm going to speed through the men and eating disorders part, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, prevalence of eating disorders in males has gone up over the years. Let me just ask you this. Um, how many of you know someone, men and women, have had someone who's had an eating disorder? Okay, very good. Uh, I'd say that's probably about eighty percent of you. Um, Ten years ago, when surveyed, forty percent of Americans knew someone that had an eating disorder. So we have a much, much larger sense of what eating disorders are nowadays. Nowadays, and it's not just for women; it's for men too. So that, that's a man with anorexia. And I point this out that it's a man with anorexia. A man who has anorexia has the same disease as a woman who has anorexia. If, if someone has, you know, a, a cold or diabetes or uh, schizophrenia, you don't say, Oh, only women get those diseases, or yeah, men men get schizophrenia different than women get it, or you know, men men get the flu different than women get it. No, it's the same disease, the same the same flu bug, you know. So when a man has an eating disorder, it's the same disorder, it's the same problem that a woman has. And it's about more than just eating disorders. So we have different kinds of eating disorders, but underlying that we have poor relationships and anxiety. We have exercise addiction, problems with sexuality. We have ineffective communication and low self-esteem and people abusing their bodies in different ways and they're traumatized and they come from dysfunctional families and there's depression and there's genetics involved. You know, these are toxic times that we're living in. I'm going to skip that. This is more about men and women having the same problems. So when we're talking about eating disorders, you know, these are typical of both men and women, that men and women would have a uh, decrease in bone density. Uh, you know, if you lose too much weight, uh, you start to lose bone density. And if you do it at the age at which most of you are at, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily come back. So there are women that had bulimia or anorexia 30 years ago that developed bone loss, and that bone loss never came back, and now they're you know, menopausal, and they have osteoporosis. And the same is true for men. There are some reasons that men develop eating disorders other than reasons that women do. For example, athletic performance. Um, wrestlers who are abusing uh, weight loss methods to, to make weight. I know in Iowa, wrestling is really, you know, I was, you know, the mecca of wrestling, they said. You guys should be proud of that. But it also, wrestlers have a high incidence of eating disorder. Uh, sometimes 
guys develop eating disorders when their father had had a, ment a medical illness for gay relationships as a result of being teased. I'm going to show you another clip here of a young man uh, who was on Dr. Phil recently, a couple weeks ago actually. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of what it's like for a man who has an eating disorder. He's young, but still. When I look in the mirror, I want to be ripped. I want to see a six pack. I want to have big arms. If I had my way, I would have zero body fat on me and just be all muscle. I'm so afraid of what food will do to my body. There was one time where I ate a normal piece of cheese by accident, and after I looked at the package, I really, really, really started to freak out. So I immediately got on the treadmill and I ran three miles. I thought that wasn't even enough, so I ran another two after that. I almost feel like I'm not a teenager just because all my friends are out partying and I'm sitting at home worrying about what my next meal is going to be. Eric says he idealized his father, Ken, who is an avid weightlifter. My obsession with being muscular started with my dad. He was always working out. He always had fitness magazines around. Eric especially wanted to work out. He would come down here and work out with me and, and really enjoyed it. He started exercising just unbelievable amounts. He said once he got started on this that this became an addiction and he couldn't stop himself. Have you been obsessed about other things in your life? Oh, I've been obsessed about a lot of things. Uh, Schoolwork, you know, I just try my best. And, you know, in many things that I do, I strive to be the best. Um, I guess that's just, you know, how I'm wired. Got the picture on the left here. Um, that's actually kind of hard to look at for me. Why? I just see, you know, rolls on my stomach. Yeah. Uh, and my face just looks so big. Uh huh. And, and what do you see on the right uh, besides a really cool hairdo? <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah. Uh, I see the muscles that, you know, I kind of was driving at, you know, what I wanted to look like. Um, okay. Um, on the picture on the left, describe the facial expression for me. It's a smile. It looks happy. This is a kid that looks really happy. Okay. All right, look at camera three right now, which is right here. This, you see that? Look right at that. All right, give me that image. It doesn't look as happy. Pardon me? It doesn't look as happy. So maybe this isn't working. Watch his eyes. I mean, maybe the payoff isn't there the way you, you think. Because it's serving a purpose. You're, it's, it's giving you what you say you want. Mm -hmm. But are you happy? Right there, you kind of got guess, it. I guess, really, no. So I, I showed that, you know, just to kind of give you an idea of, well, th this is how a person with an eating disorder feels. In this case, it's a man or a, a boy. But it's the same disease, and men get them and women get them. We have to remove the stigma attached to the idea that only uh, women get eating disorders. There's multiple causes for eating disorders. Uh, it's not just because of seeing these images on TV. Uh, genetics plays a big part. Family background. Judgments, making self-judgments. If you come from a, a judgmental family, I, I knew a, a boy with anorexia, and his parents were just really, really, they were always talking about people. This one's fat, or that one's stupid, or that one's lazy, or that one's, and, and you, you hear these things and they echo in your head. You hear your parents' voices. And if you grow up in a family where there's a lot of criticism and it's a critical family, you become self-critical. Well, they thought they were just being gossipy parents, but what they were really doing is they were instilling in their son the concept that he was unworthy. There's a drive for thinness or muscularity as a cause for eating disorders, traumatic events. Perfectionism, and we saw that with the young man. Uh, and, and diet or exercise behaviors that get out of hand. And uh, with, with a lot of the, the women we see that develop eating disorders, in a lot of cases, they just had gone, they just wanted to lose a little weight. 
and it got out of control. With a lot of the men, we see they just wanted to work out. They just wanted to e do exercise, and it got out of hand, and they became addicted, much like the young man in the, in the Dr. Phil piece. Uh, men don't seek treatment for eating disorders. Um, ten years ago, if I gave a training like I did this afternoon of professionals who work in the eating disorders field, I'd say, how many have you, have you worked with men? A few hands, maybe. Today, almost everybody raised their hand. So there, there doesn't need to be a stigma. Women, if you have a brother, if you have a, f a male friend, and you're concerned about him, and you're seeing the same kinds of symptoms in him that, you have, that you, maybe you would see in, in, in a woman friend or a sister, you have to approach him in the same way that you would her. And let him know that it's not a woman's problem or anything. I'm concerned about you, not you as a man or you as a woman. Or I, I'm just concerned about you. So, you know, the burden is on, on the women because so many men, you know, they, they really don't, they don't, they, they have no idea of what eating disorders are. They, they, they don't know that eating disorders are a problem. They may not realize that they can, that if they're running for two hours a day every day and eating only a granola bar to make up for that, that the, that's not healthy. Uh, plus, men are secretive and they'll deny it anyway. So you need to get past that machismo. It's men's nature to fix things on their own. Okay, let's talk about dieting, moving along here. Because dieting really is often at the root of these problems. All right. Oh, I was going to ask. All right, well, I won't ask. We'll go to the next slide. How many of you have ever been on a diet? Raise your hand. Hold them up there just for a minute. Come on. Ever been on a diet? Again, I think the percentages are, are, are pretty, pretty equal, and it looked like, to me, it looked like close to 80 percent or so. 91 percent of college-aged women uh, answered yes that they had been uh, on a diet. I don't know of any studies on how many men have dieted. And uh, you know, I'm the editor-in-chief of a, an international <coughs> peer-reviewed journal on eating disorders, so I should have seen something on it, but uh, there's nothing out there because men are under the radar. They aren't getting their due. How many of you are currently on a diet? Raise your hands, if you will. Yeah, no one's going to do that, so forget about that. Uh, <laughs> if you were being honest with me tonight, you probably 50% of the women would have said yes and about 25% of the men. I already told you that. Uh, you know, 95% of dieters fail to keep the weight off, and most people gain the weight back. You've probably heard that before. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. But I wanted to just point out, this is one of the uh, right after New Year's um, junk mails that I got, and normally I just delete all that stuff, of course, like we all do. This time I was kind of curious because I knew I was coming to give a talk. And so this is a website about losing weight, of course, and the real reason you're fat. Not because of genetics, not because of eating behaviors, not because of exercise behaviors, but because there's this gunk inside of your, your guts, these little critters living in your guts. And I know that that's true because the little woman in the bottom right-hand corner, she, she's a flash woman and she talks and stuff, but um, she's, a, she's a doctor, <laughs> she said. Uh, so <laughs> she's a world-famous TV doctor. Uh, and the, you, at this website, you scroll through it and they have, there's, there's no other way to, to put it, but they, they have pictures of, of uh, what they say is your intestines filled with what you know, it looks like shit. You know, so uh, she's essentially saying, you've got all this shit in your intestines that you have to get rid of, and I'm going to teach you how to get rid of it. I'm going to show you how to get rid of it. And you could lose, you know, 10, 25, 50, 100 pounds with this secret that I'm going to tell you. And I, I combed through this website trying to figure out what the product was, because there was a product. It's a book on weight loss for $70. Why do diets fail? Okay, this, this, any of you that are ever in your lives considering going on a diet or are on a diet, pay careful attention to this, okay? There's something called set point. It has to do with your metabolism. 
Weight is not a number, it's a range of about five to 10 pounds. So you know, if you're one of these people that gets on the scale every day and every morning you, you try to determine how you're gonna feel that day based on what you weigh, let me tell you, your weight fluctuates and it has nothing to do with what you've eaten or what exercise you've gotten. For women, it mainly has to do with you know, what time of the month it is for you. But men's weight fluctuates too. So you may think that, that you know, it's, it's the scale's telling you something that's reliable, but it really isn't because your weight is going like this constantly. It doesn't stay like this. So if you're on a diet and you lose a couple pounds and you feel great, well, fine. But if you gain a couple pounds, you know, why feel lousy? You're going to feel terrible about yourself. Like there was some kind of moral ineptitude on your part causing you to, to not be able to be successful at weight loss. And that wasn't me. Um, <laughs> and um, so just to understand, the scale really tells you nothing, nothing valuable. Uh, the most valuable thing I've ever seen done with a scale is be broken by an angry woman with a sledgehammer <laughs> because she empowered herself. And we're like, pow, pow, pow. And you know, we haven't had a scale in our home ever. I mean, never. And, and why would we? You know, my wife spent nine years with an eating disorder. Why would we want to be attached to that kind of baggage? If you've got a scale, if you weigh yourself, it can't do anything but make you unhappy. I encourage everyone to get rid of their scale in the most violent manner possible. <laughs> now, set point is what the natural weight is, which is most healthy for you. And your body adjusts to it. It's based on heredity, age, food choices, general health, and activity level. There's something called BMI. BMI is determined when you take a calculation with height and weight. And it's supposed to tell you whether you're obese or underweight or healthy. And it tells you really nothing. Because it doesn't take into account any of these things. Like the scale, BMI is a worthless device. Insurance companies want to, want to use it. But really, it's, 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 it's just a, it's, it's a load. Forget about it. Um, our bodies fight to maintain their set point. So if you eat more food, your body generally will increase its metabolism and burn those calories. I'm talking about people that are constant with, you know, what, what I'll call, quote, normal eating. In other words, they're not restrictors, they're not dieters, they're not yo-yo dieters, they're not binge eaters. Sometimes they eat a little bit more, sometimes they eat a little bit less. But for those people, when they eat a little bit more, the metabolism speeds up to burn those extra calories because you're, the body's defending its set point. By the same token, if you are under eating for a while, your metabolism slows down to protect itself Right? It's afraid of the starvation factor. It, it, it still thinks it's li you're living in, in a cave with um, you know, the prehistoric times and, and that, that during times of famine, it has to conserve energy. So your body will naturally do this through this mechanism called set point. And we know about these things through t twin studies. Through twin studies, we found that 70% of your weight and body shape is determined genetically. It's predetermined. There's nothing you're going to do about it. Okay? If you have two obese parents, you're going to be obese 90% of the time. If you have two thin parents, 90% you know, uh, of the time, you're, you're going to be thin. And this is true if you take two identical twins, separate them at birth, put one in a family with two large adults and parents, and uh, you take the other kid and you put that child in a family of two thin, thin parents, and you check on these, these children 10 years, 20 years later, they're going to still have, they're going to look exactly the same. It's genetics. This is the part of the show that everyone seems to enjoy the most, and I don't know why exactly, but I'm going to illustrate my point. <clears throat> on the left here is my dad, okay? And there's my son, Charlie, 
uh, at about the same age. And if you look at them, you can see they really have the same body type. They really do. And if you look at my dad and me when we were both about 30 years old with our, our kids, yeah, don't look at that kid. Look at this kid over here, huh? <laughs> this is the kid to look at here. But uh, forget about the other one anyway, because he has my wife's body. That's not Charlie. That's my, my son, Neil. And, and he, he doesn't have my body. He has my wife's body. But my dad and I have the same body. Look at our arm. Look at our shoulders. Look at our chests. It's the same body. And here's me and Charlie. And look at this here on both of us. We both have that exact same curvature, exact same in the arms, right? How often do you walk down the street and you see uh, a, a parent and a child walking and you go, oh, man, you can sure tell they, they're related, huh? You, say, you see it all the time. Well, you have families, too. And Neil does not have my, my body shape, my body type. Charlie does. So what you want to do is you want to look at your family tree and figure out whose body do I have. Do I have mothers, fathers, one of my aunts, one of my uncles, my grandparent? You know, whose body do I have? Because that's, that's your, your um, baseline. You know, that's, that's what you're going to be looking like. Look at old pictures of, of them and yourself and look at how they look now. That's how you're going to look when you're that age, for the most part, because 70% of your body shape is determined by your genetics. Here's my dad and Charlie and I when we were all 19. And again, same body type. And here's my dad. He was a little bit uh, younger than I am now. Um, but, you know, right? Same thing, right? <laughs> it, same, really? And now let me tell you something. My dad, a rest in peace, was a meat eater. Steak and potatoes, a lot of desserts, a lot of sugar, never exercised, never. I mean, you see him playing golf here, but really, you know, he would drive the cart up to, you know, and he'd hit the ball. He was not a jock at all. He, I've been a vegetarian for 40 years. I do eat fish. And I'm a jock. I play full court basketball three times a week, and I have for most of my life. I ride bikes, I hike, I swim. My dad, you know, he saw those things on TV. You know, <laughs> and yet we have exactly the same body type. It's so similar, in fact, that when he was alive and he was too uh, old to shop for clothes, I would try pants on. And if they fit me and they were a couple inches shorter, I'd know that they'd fit him. And that's how he, uh, we bought his pants for him, because we were, had the same bodies. If you have issues with your parents and you look just like them, you have something to deal with there, too. But that's for another night. <laughs> OK. How to feel better about your body and yourself. All right. Because this, is what I, this was the promise I gave you when you came in. I said, you know, these are rough times. These are terrible times in many ways. And you really don't want to be feeling bad about yourself. You know, you can feel, there's so many other things to feel bad about that are outside of your control. We can't control the state of the economy or the war in Iraq. But we really can control how we feel about ourselves. So you want to practice media literacy, as I said. You want to get better role models. Think of me as your role model, really. I, you know, I, I'm a role model for positive body image. I like myself. Accept your genetic influences. Celebrate your personal uniqueness. Be more compassionate towards yourself and others. Don't diet. It's not going to help you in any way. And you know, eat a balanced diet. Eat reasonably well. If you don't know what that means, go to mypyramid.gov, and it explains that's uh, from the American Dietetic Association. It explains about healthy eating. And 
that you want carbohydrates and you want um, to get your vegetables and fruits. And you know, a little cut back a little bit on the oils and which oils are good. You know, olive oil is a great, great food. It's great for you. Eat a lot of olive oil. Eat olives. Eat avocados. Do they have avocados in uh, Iowa? Yeah. <laughs> do you have them in your backyard? No. <laughs> uh, I do. Um, so learn a little bit about nutrition. Guys don't know anything about nutrition for the most part. Guys, learn something about nutrition. Uh, get some good exercise. I love this picture. These guys taking the escalator <laughs> to work out. Um, so, you know, uh, there, there's a pretty decent book up there called Exercise Balance that I edited and published. And uh, essentially, it comes down to you want to get about 20 to 40 minutes per day on average of exercise at the minimum. So over the course of a week, you want to get about two and a half to five hours per week. If you do that for the rest of your lives, you will see a 21% decrease in your mortality. If you exercise 45 to 60 minutes, even better. Not every day, five to seven hours a week, okay? If you're exercising for more than an hour a day, you know, unless you're in training for a sport, it may be too much. And if you're going to exercise that much, you really have to eat more than just a granola bar. You have to properly get adequate nourishment, men and women. All right, I'm going to wind it pretty quickly here with a few more things. Have fulfilling relationships. I've got just a wonderful relationship with my family, with close friends. Uh, the guys in the upper right there are uh, the two guys on the right played on my high school football team with me. The young guy that's standing next to me was my high school football coach. Went on to become the uh, executive director of the President's Council on Physical Fitness. So I had a good role model in, in Richard Keeler. Have fun and express your creativity. All work and no play, you know, that's no good. Uh, as I said, I like to play basketball. I like to play music. I like to sing now and then. Uh, people don't like hearing me sing, so I won't uh, do that with you. I, uh, I am very passionate about painting. Uh, that's one of my oil paintings from the Dominican Republic. I think one of my better ones. Uh, find fulfillment in your work. You know, I'm so blessed, I'm so lucky to be able to come out here or the other places I've been and talk to people like this. This is my work. This is what I do. I help people. It's a wonderful thing. Find fulfillment in whatever work it is that you have, even if you're a blacksmith like this guy here. <laughs> Be brave. This again is my son, Neil, uh, who does not have my body type, uh, walking across fire. Uh, Be brave. These are tough times. Be brave. Spend time in nature. You, know, you have to get off. You have to get away from the cars and get away from the buildings and get away from all the other people. This was from a trip we took last summer that was just wonderful in the uh, Bob Marshall Wilderness in um, Montana. And we spent a week there, and in the first six days we only saw two other people. Oh, it was great. No cell phones, no electricity, no cars, no motors. Get away from it. Spend time alone. Relax. You know, your generation, and I, you know, I, I hate saying things like that, your generation, Mike, but you know, you're so connected. You know, you've got the Facebook and the, uh, what's that thing, the texting and, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, email and Twitter and, you know, phone calls. How many of you have gotten a text tonight during this talk? You know, <laughs> spend some time alone. Turn the phone off once in a while. I actually once got a phone call while I was giving one of these talks. One of my sons called me. I said, they can't talk right now. I'm in the middle of giving a talk. Um, relax. Uh, I like relaxing by taking you know, a hot tub, getting in the hot tub. This is outside our back door near the avocado tree. And, um, <laughs> and I'm in it every day, every day. And I just oh, melt, my, melt my problems. I don't have many problems. But uh, if I had problems, I'd be melting away. One of the reasons I don't have a lot of problems is because I relax. And I do all the rest of this stuff. I'm telling you, I'm not making this stuff up. You know, you don't have to be uptight within your own being. The, the oddest thing happened to me when I was 
I was 25 years old, and I, I'd been unreasonably happy for a number of days in a row. Uh, it was following a friend's wedding where there was a lot of intoxication and sex. But, <laughs> I, I, um, but I got home, and I, I, I just felt, it was before I was married, uh, I, and, and, I, um, and I just felt just really just happy, you know, how sometimes you feel. And it went on for a couple days, and it went on for another day, and all of a sudden I had the thought, well, maybe I could just be like this all the time. I could just be happy all the time. And you know what? I kind of have. I mean, I've had hardships. D d d don't, don't get me wrong. I've had, my children have had illnesses. My parents and sister have died. Um, I've faced, I was on the you know, verge of bankruptcy uh, at one point in my life. Uh, we had employees we had to uh, use our credit card to pay our employees to keep the business going. I've had hardships, but through it all, I've maintained an optimism about life, an optimism about who I am, a self-acceptance, a feeling that I'm okay who I am, and that I can rise above whatever it is that's out there. Let that happen out there. In here, I'm okay, and I'm going to be okay. And it's worked for me. It really has. And when I say, let me be a role model for you, I'm, honest to God, I'm getting chills up and down my spine telling this to you. You know, sh shooting up and down my spine, I'm feeling, wow, this is a, this is a heavy moment. This is an important moment. Because some, some of you are hearing this. And some of you are actually going to retain this. And you're going to have a better life as a result. And who knows what the future brings. But if you're not hung up on your body, if you're not hung up on unhappiness and can really find contentment within your own being, you've got it beat. I mean, you know, I, I've lived a long and happy life, and it sure beats living a long and unhappy life. Let me tell you, that's the truth. Okay? See the divine everywhere and in everyone, especially yourself. You know, I, I see every one of you, and, and I, I just appreciate so much that you came. And a lot of you, I had the chance to just thank you when you came in. Thanks for coming. I appreciate you came, you came tonight. And when I say that to you, I, you know, I look at you and I, I see you as, as God. I mean, you're just divine. You're wonderful, wonderful people. And I, I see myself the same way, as I've said. So, you know, do that. You know, instead of being critical and judgmental about people, be accepting and loving with people. This was taken um, a week ago on the roof of my house looking up at the sky. It was kind of, kind of cool. Um, treat others and yourself with love and respect. That's the bottom line. That's the whole thing. That's the whole message. That's all I got to say. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. For some questions, um, there we don't make sure you guys eat some food on your way out. We can't have an eating disorder thing without having food. So grab some snacks, and also um, Lee will be available for some book signing um, if you're interested in, in checking that out. And t-shirts. Yes, and we still have some of the Eda t-shirts that um, say "Rock Your Body" back there. Um, also, um, I just want everybody to know, Student Counseling Services is located in the Student Services Building. If you don't know where we're at. Um, look us up on the internet. Does anybody have any questions for Lee? Nobody ever has questions. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. We ask questions. It's about that, the set point. Yes, uh, about set point. Um, if somebody has an eating disorder, how does that set point work? When, I mean, it, gets, it gets thrown out of whack. So if somebody is recovering, does it? Does it, takes a, it takes quite a while to readjust. So... <clears throat> In the same way that when somebody, yeah, the question was about um, set point and what happens if you have an eating disorder or what happens to your set point. And look, you can leave. It's okay if people are leaving. I'm not offended. But if you want to stay and do the questions and answers, do that. So what happens is, you know, lots of times you go on a diet and you start losing a lot of weight real quick and then you plateau and then you slowly start gaining weight back. The same kind of thing happens with an eating disorder. It takes a long time. You might gain a lot of weight back real quickly, but then you plateau and it takes a longer time to gain more weight back. And it may take, you know, it may take a year. It may take longer than a year 
to eventually find where your natural set point is. Uh, there is something called diet-induced obesity. People that go on yo-yo diets throw their set point off so badly in some cases that they become obese. Their metabolism stops working properly. Yeah, you can also look up, read the refeeding syndrome, and that'll explain to you quite a bit about the phases your body needs to go through um, after you've thrown it off so far so that you know what to expect. Um, today you mentioned about the diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa, and I thought it was interesting the point you brought up about how women are, um, one of the criteria is amenorrhea, and then for men, why don't we test for testosterone levels? Right. So can you talk more about that? Uh, no. No. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, it, for anorexia, there's what we call diagnostic criteria. Uh, if you meet A, B, C, and D, you have anorexia. Uh, one of the diagnostic criteria uh, is that uh, for females that they lose three consecutive menstrual periods. Uh, for men, there's no similar kind of um, measure. However, uh, men do have lowered testosterone levels when they have low weight. And in the upcoming diagnostic criteria, we'll see a change where uh, testosterone levels are going to be measured as, as one of those things. Before, um, before you ask that question, I also want, um, one of the things um, that, that I want really want the men on campus to know and to, sh to spread the information about around campus is in response to the needs of the men on campus, we have changed all of our groups to co-ed groups on campus. And um, I just really want um, the men on campus to know that we are a confidential, safe resource of professionals who understand that this, that that this is not a woman's issue, that this is a, a person issue, a people issue. Um, and, and we really want to get the word out that there is hope, there is a place to go on campus for some help. I love that you brought up how bad the objectification of men is getting in the media, just you know, all parts of the media with marketing and television and movies. And um, I'm, I'm seeing it get worse and worse. And I would disagree with you a little bit in that. I don't think it's to the same level yet. Um, and also I think it's important, I in my opinion, that it's not having the exact same effect because of the history of how long it's happened for women and, and the power issues between the genders and um, violence things. And <laughs> that's a whole other story. But, but I can see that at some point, it could get really close to that. It could become almost as detrimental for men as it is for women um, if it continues on the path it is. And so I'm so glad that you brought that into your talk um, because it, it's, it's like it sneaks up on us and we don't realize it's happening until it's gotten really bad for people. Let me just say that for women, you know, they've been faced with that objectification and sexualization for 40 years or so, you know, since the 60s. For men, it's only been gone, going on for 10, 15 you know, years. If it continues like this 25 years from now, you'll see absolutely as much you know, eating disorders in men as women. Uh, hopefully, it won't go on that long. Yeah, uh, ac actually, sometimes I do talk a lot about obesity and the, quote, obesity epidemic, and I, I don't buy into it. Uh, I don't buy into reports that uh, we're a nation that's tremendously overweight and out of shape. Out of shape, perhaps. Not fit, definitely. Overweight? Based on what? You know, if, 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 if you look at your, yourself compared to your parents, especially for the guys, most of the guys are larger than their parents are. They're taller. Our bodies are growing. If you look at you know, uniforms from the Civil War, Revolutionary War, they're a bunch of little people. They're like this big. You know, we're getting larger and larger as, as a species. Uh, so that's part of it. So you know, we're using standards of measurement that were established um, in, in the 60s, uh, 40 years ago, 
based on uh, members of the military. And so we're taking you know, people in the prime of their life, in their tw you know, 20s, late teens, early 20s, much like yourselves, uh, and we're saying that that's the standard that we're going to measure all of society against. Well, you know, I eat the same now that I ate when I was 23 years old. I get the same amount of exercise now that I got when I was 23 years old. But my weight has gone on a steady increase through the years. A healthy increase. The healthiest pattern of weight is actually a slight, moderate, gradual weight gain through your life until you hit your 60s and then you begin to decline. Um, but what, what we're being told by the media is that people in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s should have the bodies of 20 year olds. And that's what a lot of the obesity, quote obesity epidemic is being based on. I, I do go into it in other talks. Um, time restraints, I, I didn't get into it too much tonight. I'm gonna jump in for a second. The other thing that we have to look at is that metabolism piece that um, we mentioned earlier, that every time you diet, you throw your metabolism off and you're going to, um, you're going to um, gain back what you, I think, I think it's you too close to that, Anna. Ah. <laughs> um, you're going to gain back everything you lost plus another 10 to 15 percent of, of that weight. And so every time you yo-yo diet, um, you throw yourself back to where you were plus. So every time you do that, um, you're, set, you're resetting your set point weight. And as a country, if that pattern is happening with, you know, the billions and billions of dollars that are going into that, we are going to see the average size just continue to go up. Yeah. I, I actually had one question for really? you, Lee. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you coming here to Iowa State. Um, I think this is wonderful information. It's so important. Um, and I was really curious about um, your personal belief, what you consider to be one of the biggest deterrents um, for men pursuing treatment um, if they feel like they might be dealing with something like this. What do you think might be one of the biggest factors that is preventing them from seeking help. I know you, you talked about that a little bit in your yeah, I, I think there's you know two or three things. One is that uh, they're ignorant. They don't know that they have a problem. They think that they're just engaging in normal behavior. They're not aware that they have behavior that can, can be clinically diagnosed and treated. Uh, and if they do realize that they have a problem, they think that they have a woman's problem, that they're feminized and that they're embarrassed and ashamed by that and really should not be. So there's that stigma. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Um, just because you said, you asked us how many of us knew somebody who struggled with an eating disorder or some sort of other disorder. And I, I imagine a lot of us know uh, guys who are compulsive exercisers who are maybe binge eaters or things like that. But you hit on a really good point of macho male culture. How does Yeah. You know, realistically, without like having your man part taken away from you. Yeah. That fear that you have when you talk to another man. Well, you know, um, remember first of all that most guys are first and foremost interested in what women think of them, and interested in women, or or gay guys in, in other guys, and what the, what I heard from the women tonight was that they want men who are compassionate. They're interested in compassion. So if you trade in that man card for a little bit of compassion, sensitivity, and better communication, then you know, you're being real, you're being genuine, and that's where you want to be. You want, you want to be your truest self. If, you know, your truest self is being honest at all times in all situations. Um, and if you have a friend who you see has a problem, it is your obligation, it's your moral obligation to say something about it. You have a problem, let's talk about this. I care about you. I'm not coming on to you, but I care about you. I want you to get help. I mean, you know, we've all had friends, close friends, you know, confide in us things. And it's just something, it's just the same level of, of close communication and being a confidant is what, what you want to be. It's not, not being manly, it's not being feminized, it's being true yourself and genuine. 
Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the NCAA a number of years ago outlawed a lot of um, weight loss techniques. Uh, and you may still be familiar with some of these. You, you, there may be people still, do, still doing these things under the radar. Um, for example, wearing those rubber suits and getting into a sauna and exercising for weight loss, strictly forbidden. Uh, um, the use of laxatives, uh, diuretics, strictly forbidden. Um, unfortunately, so at the highest levels, while there may be some abuse of, of these regulations from the NCAA, which came out of people dying, incidentally, um, you have a trickle-down effect that not all of the youth coaches, let's say, let's say you're a, a youth coach and you're coaching 10-year-olds to be wrestlers, um, and you were a wrestler and your dad was a wrestler, you're going to do the same, you're going to coach them in the same way that you were coached. And it may be in ways that really are not proper anymore, you know, th that aren't allowed anymore. Um, the, the best evidence against using those kinds of devices is performance. Uh, you might get into a lower weight class, but at what expense? Uh, loss, uh, the, the tests show that uh, people who are underweight, uh, who are malnourished, are weaker, they don't have uh, the same, uh, their muscle fibers aren't firing in the same manner, they don't have the same levels of strength. So, so fine, so you got to a lower weight class and you're going to wrestle some other guy that got to that lower weight class too, but you're not going to be at your best. So uh, I think that the same messages that were coming down through the NCAA about 10 years ago, you have got to reach the youth levels. It's very important that you realize that you want to be wrestling at the weight that is your natural weight because that's the weight that you're going to be able to perform at, at your best at. I think the other thing you have to prepare for is how do I live my life post-wrestling living a life that's off-season? Um, you know, so many of the wrestlers, even when they're off season, are actually training harder if they're doing some independent um, um, leagues outside of the, the regular season. Um, there is the definitely the yo-yo, um, and we're, act, we're seeing um, post-wrestling men who are struggling much worse with their eating behaviors and their body image post being a wrestler than even in the midst of actually being active wrestler. Yeah, and, and I've had men uh, contact me, because you know, I hear from everybody, uh, who have said, yeah, I was a high school wrestler and I cut my weight and learned about how to throw up to lose weight, but then you know, I stopped wrestling and I stopped doing that, and about 15 years later, I started doing it again. And I don't know why I started doing it, but I did. So it was, you know, he, men who had become bulimic, essentially, because of skills or techniques that they had learned uh, when they were younger as wrestlers. So uh, the other thing is, is uh, you know, the, the worst thing you want to do is get into an overtraining situation. You know, training, you know, you want to be training at your peak, for peak performance at the highest level. And you can overtrain so that your body really is not functioning at its best. Higher incidence of injuries, stress fractures, uh, lower levels of, of strength and, and uh, power and, and speed. So it's finding that correct median, uh, that, that correct performance line, and it has a lot to do with nourishment, that you have to keep yourself well nourished if you're burning all those calories uh, through your sport and your training. Thank you again. Thank you again.